Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Um, my name is Ike J. I'm, I'm an architect. I'm also the um, senior fellow for um, housing and urban space at Policy Exchange. So, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, as you all know, hopefully, today's session will be Building Back Better, How to Deliver High Quality Homes and Extend the Dream of Home Ownership. So nice, easy questions for us all to grapple with towards the end of the afternoon. Um, it's not obviously just me speaking um, throughout this event. We have four esteemed speakers here who will also be taking us through um, the pertinent issues um, connected to this subject. Um, before I introduce them, I'll just give a quick introduction. Um, we all know that the housing crisis is one of the most serious and grave political and socio-economic socio -economic challenges facing the UK and the UK government today. The government has a target of 300,000 homes to build each year, which it's yet to meet. But for all manner of political, aesthetic, urban and environmental reasons, it's essential that all, those, all that new housing is built to the highest possible architectural and construction quality. <coughs> The challenge is how do we ensure that we build all these new homes and extend the dream of home, home ownership while maintaining quality while we're doing that as well. So that's the challenge which we're all going to be grappling with today. Um, in terms of our speakers, we're first going to hear from um, a minister, Christopher Pincher, to my right, who has been a Conservative MP for Tamworth in Staffordshire since 2010. He's also Minister of State at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. And oh, I know that's been recently renamed. I'll leave it to um, Christopher to um, <laughs> elucidate the details of the new title. But um, before that, he served as a member, uh, served a number of um, senior roles, including Deputy Chief Government Whip and Treasurer of the Household. Um, after. Um, the Minister will hear from Lewis Sidnick, who is the Director of Corporate Affairs at the National H House Building Council, over to the, my far right. Um, he has over 20 years of experience working in senior executive roles for global business in the UK and the EU, including the British Chamber of Commerce and the European Housing Trade Association. Um, as we all know, NHBC strive for, to raise construction standards in new homes and provide warranty protections for home buyers. And they're also our gracious um, sponsors this afternoon as well. After Lewis, we'll hear from Rosie Tugood to my left, who is the CEO of Legal and General Modular Homes, and where she leads the modular business in developing the product portfolio, creating engineering and production capability, and establishing its market position. Rosie has held senior roles across customer-facing business areas, new product introduction, and in setting up global supply chains to deliver complex engineering products. Um, LNG as well have also been at the forefront in developing new UK housing typologies and sectors, including modular construction, which is why Rosie's here, and expanding the um, built-to-rent sector as well. And last but not least, we'll hear from Patrick Mellier on my far left, who is the Chief Executive of Sunderland City Council. He was previously Chief, Exec Chief Executive with North Tyneside Council, where he has a track record of delivering on major projects that involve multiple partnerships and also providing leadership for the transformation of the 13 hectares of prime enterprise zone land at Swans in the Northeast into a hub for the offshore renewable energy and advanced engineering sectors. Um, as well as that, um, I had the pleasure of visiting Sunderland for the first time just before the pandemic, and can I, I, can, I can attest to the effort they're making there to really regenerate the town centre and um, to bring the kind of um, new positive development with housing as well into the town centre as well. And I also recommend, um, if any of you have been to Whitley Bay, there's a, there's a new um, development called Spanish City, which is also within um, Patrick's remit, which is also another wonderful example of regeneration, the kind of thing we should be all promoting. So for all those reasons, for um, all our esteemed guests. Thank you very much for um, contributing. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before um, we begin. Um, we'll start with um, every panellist will get um, around three or four minutes, I think, to, as, uh, for a brief introduction whereby they'll, um, they'll they lay their stall and um, um, discuss these issues. And um, while they're speaking, please don't ask questions during that period, but note questions down or um, have them in your mind. And there'll be, a, there'll be a period at the end of the session where I'll open up to the floor and you'll be able to present your questions. So after they've um, all done their sessions, we'll have a panel discussion, maybe for about 15 minutes, where I'll kind of probe them intellectually, in terms of trying to find, um, <laughs> trying to take the discussion, I shouldn't have said that, apologies, but um, 
discuss discuss the matters that they've um, they've raised. Um, after that, um, at the end of the session, we'll open it to the floor, and all the questions you've been um, diligently writing and keeping in your heads, you'll be then able to um, present to the panelists. Um, while questions to the speakers will be grateful. Um, we'll be grateful for them. Um, speeches will not be tolerated, so please try and keep the questions um, trim. Um, they'll either be curtailed or interrupted if they take too long, in the politest way possible, um, I promise. But um, also, when you're about to um, present a question, please give your name and the company or organization that you represent as well, just to keep things all above board. Right, um, I think that's enough for me. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into the subject and we'll first hear from the minister, Christopher Pincher, and he will give us an introduction into how we can magically solve the housing crisis and maintain building quality. Over to you. Well, can I borrow your magic wand, <laughs> first of all? And welcome everybody to, what is it, day three of Conservative Party Conference and its fringe events. Uh, many of you may have heard much of what we are going to talk about today, already talked about. But I, I therefore make no apology if you have to listen to my jokes more than once. <laughs> but it is an axiom of politics that although everything that has been said or can be said has been said, not everybody that can say it has said it. So there's still room for more <laughs> people to say what they think. How do we solve the challenge of delivering more homes and more good quality homes, the homes that our country needs. First of all, I should say that I think we've done a pretty good job over the last 10 years of delivering more homes. We've built something like a million new homes during that time. And in the last year, 2019, 2020, before COVID struck, we built 244,000 new homes that's more than have been built in any year in the last 30 years. But it's still not enough, because if you talk to any organisation, be it KPMG or be it Shelter, uh, they will say that we need to build north of 250,000 homes each year, 300,000 homes each year, in order to meet the challenge of having enough homes for our country's purposes. And we want to do that, meet that challenge, through a number of means. Firstly, we need to reform and overhaul our aged planning system. As you've probably heard me say before, it takes something like seven years for local plans to be made, and it can take a further five years for spades to cut into the earth, building the properties that we need after that point. The planning system is far too slow. It's also far too opaque and unnavigable it doesn't engage enough people. And if you think that only 1% of a local population gets involved in local plan making, you'll know what I mean. We need a planning system which is far more transparent, uh, which engages local communities far more effectively and early on, so that the planning system becomes, if not uh, less controversial, then certainly less adversarial. We want it to be a system which more people are engaged in and we want it to be more predictable for the communities concerned, for developers big and small and for the stakeholders in local government and other local experts. And that's what our planning reforms are designed to do. To make the system far more speedy, that's why we say that we want local plans to be made within 30 months. To make it far more transparent and navigable uh, so that uh, SMEs particularly can engage more effectively in it because SMEs tend to build on the parcels of land that nobody else wants to build upon. Uh, they build in different designs to different tenures and that means that we increase our housing stock whilst reducing the stress on greener sites that people would prefer to see kept. And we need to make the system far more uh, predictable in order that everybody, as I say, knows what the outcomes are going to be and knows where uh, development should take place and where it should not. And that means that people can be more certain about how their local community will develop. But as well as regulatory changes like uh, our planning system, we also need to invest more in 
affordable homes. That's what the £11.5 billion of additional revenue that we are putting into the affordable homes programme between 2021 and 2026 will do. It will build something like 180,000 new homes across our country. Half of those will be for shared ownership. The rest will be for affordable rent. 32,000 of them will be for social rent. That's double the number of socially rentable homes than is being built in the present programme. But we also want to make sure that the dream of home ownership is extended as far as it possibly can be. And that's why we are introducing first homes, which will enable local people chosen uh, by local councils, it could be first responders, it could be local key workers, uh, they will have the opportunity of buying affordable homes built out of the developers' contributions at discounted rates of at least 30%. And that discount will be baked into the property's covenant, which means that when it's sold on, if it's sold on, the property will have to be again sold at that discounted rate to another local person or family. So we're creating owned homes for local people. We also want people to be able to design and build their own homes, something which is popular on the continent and in North America, but isn't so popular in the United Kingdom. And the Help to Build scheme, which you're going to hear about uh, shortly, will put some significant funding uh, aside to help people do exactly that. And I'm really grateful to Richard Bacon and the work that he has been doing uh, to find ways of expediting uh, custom and self-build in our country. And I also want to make sure that right to buy uh, continues and is reinvigorated so people have the opportunity to buy their own home if they live in it as a socially rentable property. By these means, we will build more homes. We will build better quality and homes of greater and different design. And we'll build homes that people can buy and own and have a stake in the country. Because as I've said before, as is a party that believes in the right and the opportunity of home ownership, the right and the opportunity to have a stake in your country and in your community and a stake for the future, for yourself, for your family. We're a party of aspirational capitalism. And the best way to promote capitalism is to create more capitalists. And the best way to create more capitalists is to give people the right to own their own home. Those are the means by which we intend to deliver our objectives, and I look forward to hearing what you think about them. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very succinct. Thank you. Um, perfect. Right. Um, Lewis, Lewis Signick from the um, NHBC will give us his thoughts on this issue now. So over to you, Pete. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, really pleased to be here uh, this year. This is our 12th uh, Conservative Party conference event in a row. We've been coming for 12 years holding fringe events, so we're pleased to keep that going and held one on Zoom last year, so uh, it's good to be back here in person. Uh, I, think, I think most of you know who, who we are and what we do at uh, NHPC, but for those of you who, who don't, we, we work in the industry to try and support the delivery of high-quality new homes uh, in the sector, and we're an independent, non-profit distributing organisation. <coughs> Excuse me, and, and we do this by two main ways. We, we set construction standards, so about 70 or 80 percent of all homes that are built in the UK are built according to our technical standards, and we provide a 10-year build mark warranty. And there's about 1.6 million homeowners with uh, with the benefit of our warranty. And any any uh, surplus that we have as non-profit distributing goes back to support the industry deliver high-quality new homes. Um, just very briefly from me, I just wanted to, to make three points that I'm calling the three S's today for, to just work down that way, supply, skills, and selling homes. I think supply, um, we're here to talk about delivering more, more high quality new homes and the supply side has been on a roller coaster ride through COVID with uh, last, uh, last year when, when COVID hit, the, our figure showed uh, in the quarter after COVID, the first lockdown was 60% fall in the number of homes that were being built. But the industry has recovered really rapidly, um, and uh, NHBC figures for quarter two of this year, 2021, showed a 130% increase in the number of new homes compared to the same quarter last year. So some really positive news there on the supply side. And we're back to pre-COVID uh, pre levels and better, really, is, is, a, is a good way of sum, summing that up. 
but there's still a long way that needs to go um, uh, to meet supply uh, issues and challenges in, within the UK. And one area that we're focusing on at NHBC is MMC, all these acronyms, uh, Modern Methods of Construction. <laughs> and we, I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, from our colleagues on the panel. But MMC, um, Modern Methods of Construction, is a really important way to support uh, faster and, and uh, homes, high quality homes. And we've launched a, a product called NHBC Accepts, which is to try and give confidence uh, to the industry and to homeowners in the quality of MMC. Um, and if you have confidence, then, then it can help support the sector. Um, so linked to supply, my first S is skills, which is such a big issue. I think when we see the petrol issues that have gone on with the lack of available skills for lorry drivers, you start to think about impacts on other sectors in different ways. And within our sector, we, we've struggled with skill shortages for a long time. And um, CITB, the construction body, estimate that uh, we need another 200,000 workers in the sector over the next five years, nearly 200,000, which is massive and uh, just shows the challenge out there. We're, we're trying hard at NHBC to, to work with government. We, we opened an, a, um, a training hub in, in uh, the minister's constituency in Tamworth, um, which is a fantastic uh, hub. There's some great young people work, uh, going through that learning, so some skills at the moment. Uh, and we provide 17,000 days of training a year f through NHBC, so trying to do our bit. But what we found through our research to the NHBC Foundation if you go into a school and speak to young people, do, do you want to work in the construction sector? They say no, basically, is the, is the summary. Like nine out of ten uh, young people in schools say they're not interested in working in the construction sector. When you educate them about the careers in the sector, the opportunities in the construction sector, and try and sort of correct some of the stereotypes, the interest goes right up. So I think we're, the, a big lesson there is, you know, sometimes complicated problems have simple solutions, and sometimes it can be easy as educating young people about the career opportunities in the sector, and that will go a long way to helping, helping solve that problem. And my last point uh, that I just wanted to mention, my third S, uh, supply skills, is selling a home. I think um, uh, when when we talk about housing too often uh, politicians and people in the industry are focusing on the negatives uh, uh, something goes wrong with the home uh, and it gets a you know double page spread in the newspaper it can be a horror story and, and that's you know terrible if that happens and it, and it absolutely should never happen um, we want all homes to be very high quality but we do need to remember that the vast majority of homes are very good quality. The vast majority of homeowners are very happy with their homes. You know, we know this because we're at NHBC, we provide the insurance and we, we vast majority of people don't have to come to us with any problem. Um, and, and I think, you know, if we are working together with government and industry to build more of this product, build more homes, I think we want to work to tell people that these new homes are good quality and make them desirable. Um, for people, it would be like Apple producing a new iPhone and saying, you know, our iPhone's rubbish. You know, we, they just wouldn't do that. So I think we all need to say, here, there's a new home and they're great. Um, so, so as I said, they're high quality, they're greener, they're, they're environmentally friendly, they, they're cheaper to run, they save on energy bills, they come with a warranty, a new home that an older home wouldn't. So I think that's a really important message to sort of that uh, we want everyone collectively to get behind uh, the sector more and be more positive. So, um, so that's my three points. Supplier, the long roller coaster, long way to go, but MMC is key to that. Skills, it's about young people and about um, educating young people on the opportunities in the sector. And selling a home, let's be positive about homes. Let's try to make them more desirable rather than focusing on, on negatives uh, that there are. Uh, and then that will help, hopefully, uh, make a contribution to the housing uh, problems at the moment. Thank you very much. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Very positive take. So um, just out of interest, just quickly, I'll just jump in briefly. Why do you th in terms of skills, I know skills is obviously a shortage is a big issue um, with construction. What, why do you think aspirationally, you mentioned young people don't really consider construction something to go into until they're maybe told a bit more detail about what it involves. Why do you think that is? Is it a cultural it's thing? It's a perception it thing. They think, young people think of um, working in construction sectors like just all it is is, you know, sort of men laying bricks <laughs> and that's that's the whole sector, which it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many different jobs and opportunities mm. and it needs to be 
uh, needs to be better education on that. I think the government is doing you know a great job on some of that. We're working our foundation is working with, with officials on a, on a lot of that area. Which good. Is, so it's going in the right direction. Brilliant. Okay. Good. Positive answer as well. Which is what I'd like to hear. Thank you. Um, right, number three, um, Rosie Tugood from um, CEO of Legal in General Modular Homes. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, the question I usually get asked most is Legal in General. Why are they, you know, why is an insurance company building homes? Well, well, first of all, we're not really just an insurance company. We invest significant amounts of money in the UK to, you know, rebuild infrastructure in the UK. We've invested heavily in in Sunderland and, and, and many parts of the UK. And we have a, a growing housing division of which the modular business is part. And the modular business was set up um, about four years ago uh, with the sponsorship of our chief executive to unashamedly change the way in which we build houses in Britain. And you know, you kind of just step back and look at um, some of the points that have just been made about you know how we build houses in Britain and, and the perception of that. And and you know the, the industry does need modernization. And one of the approaches that we're taking is to, you know, change, uh, create, bring a disruptive approach to the industry and build houses in a factory. And, you know, at that point, people's mind boggles as well. You know, building houses in a factory, how does that work? Well, you know, in, in very simple terms, um, we're really just borrowing the techniques that many industries have used for decades and adapting them to construction. You know, automotive, aerospace have been on this journey for quite some time. And it's one of the reasons why we were, you know, we had the faith in being able to bring the techniques from those industries to construction and really change the way in which houses are built. And, and you know, it's been proven in those industries and we believe we're on a path to prove it in, in, in the UK in construction. And, and really, what, you know, what it starts with is, you know, any kind of lean manufacturing techniques start with a focus on the customer. You know, the customer defines value. So, you know, understanding what's really important for a customer right now and understanding what will be important for a customer in the future, because this is an asset that someone's going to own probably for 100 years and more. So, you know, starting with that, we've really, you know, changed the way in which we, we are designing and building homes, you know taking into account the you know desires of of of, of co consumers the, the owners of the homes to have a, a house that they can be proud of for a number of years and and thinking about the environmental challenges as well both from a point of view of the the carbon involved in building a home and the carbon that that home will emit through its life and you know the approach is really um, a very simple one you know thinking about what those customer desires are, thinking about what the needs are and really incorporating them into the design and then very simply, you know, breaking down that design into simple steps, creating a bill of materials and a bill of process so that we can understand all of the parts that go into the the the, the, the module and then understand how we should put them together in a very, very simple kind of Meccano set kind of way. I'm very pleased to say that the Minister's been to our factory very recently and seen that in action. The, you know, the factory is now really starting to, to motor and produce, uh, produce homes um, through this process. We're out on three sites at the moment, building over 450 homes through this method. Uh, over the next 18 months, we'll build another 750 homes on, on four different sites that we've uh, got identified through the pipeline. So the process is really, really starting to to, to mature and, and we're starting to deliver. And that's been a, a long fought journey, but it's it's one where, you know, we're really starting to demonstrate the, the principles that come from modern manufacturing techniques. And that's, that is really to, to drive down costs, to drive up productivity, to drive up quality, to, to, to drive up capacity and build capacity for the industry and to drive the sp increase the speed with which houses are built. And in doing all of this, pass more functionality to the customer, build better homes with less quality defects. And, you know, that's the journey we're on, and I'm really pleased to say we're, you know, we're, we're, we're taking that approach. So, so all of our homes come with photovoltaic cells on the roof. All of our homes are designed with a fabric-first approach, so we design them to be insulated well so that they're built to last, but also built with materials that make them naturally cool in the summer and, and warm in the winter. And we think sensitively about how they're plotted on sites and the, the thermal properties of things like the glass and, and, and um, 
and things like doors so that we, we can balance temperature through through the, the life of the, the um, and the temperature through the seasons so it's comfortable for, for people to, to, to live in. And we you know we're, we're also, as well as delivering houses with photovoltaic cells, installing air source heat pumps on all of our homes. So really making these homes for the future fit for people to live in and, and, and enjoy for quite some time. And all of these homes will be delivered as EPCA or net zero, depending on the customer requirement in the in the local area and, and what we're, we're delivering to, which, which customer we're delivering to. So, you know, I think in terms of building back better, you know, we're setting out with a different ambition. We're setting out with an ambition to, to change the industry. We have some natural advantages from the way in which we design and build our homes in a factory. Um, you know, the homes that we're building right now are coming off the production line. We have this ethos of no fault forward. So as, as the home goes through each stage of the production, checks are done to make sure that we're capturing any quality issues that, that happen and we're, we're, we're rectifying them there and then. So our homes get to the end of the production line with, with typically less than 10, 10 snags at the end of the line. And, and we're not very happy about that. You know, we fix those at the end of the line and then you know, move on and make sure that they're not repeated. And, and this is the sort of ethos that's borrowed from many other industries and I think can, can really change the way in which we're, you know, we're, we're building homes in Britain. Um, it's an important step forward. Many of the lessons that we're learning in the factory can be employed on site, and we do employ them on site when we finish the homes, when we deliver them to site. And I think many of the techniques that we're using can be deployed across the industry. We're building new skills into the industry, but I like to say we can bring people in from all walks of life and build the skills. We have a modular academy at the facility where we train people to, to do the parts of the production process that we need them to do to the quality standard we need them to do that at. It's not a short journey. It's uh, it's taken quite some time to get to the point that we're at, and and we will always need to improve. You know, it's a journey of continuous improvement. But you know, we're starting to change the way in which homes are built in this this country, and I hope people will start to see when they can walk down streets with modular homes that we've we and some of our um, other colleagues in this industry have produced. They can start to see that it's a really different way to build homes in Britain, and a, a really way a good way that's changing the industry. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I th it's really interesting. The idea. Obviously, it's wonderful to have this kind of innovation um, I in house building. And I was really intrigued by um, the point about borrowing techniques from other industries, such as um, aviation, automation, um, industries which regularly use principles such as modular construction. Um, my very brief question is Do you think that, A, there's um, obviously we all, we have phones which are mass produced. We have cars which are mass produced, washing machines or whatever. Do you think there's a stigma with people thinking that their home is mass produced? Uh, do you think there's something particular about housing whereby people want something to be want it to be unique? Um, that's the first part. And the second part is if there is a stigma, maybe associated from ideas of prefab housing after the war. Um, what is it about your system that can overcome? that kind of yeah. idea that modularity might not necessarily be what you want in a home, even though you're happy with it, with your phone. Mm. That makes I, sense. I, I, I think with most things, people want something that's good value, you yeah. know, they've, that works, that they're comfortable with, you know, that, that doesn't give them any problems. And, you know, that's our first promise to people. Um, I think modular does still carry this stigma, you know. Um, I won't say the P word, but <laughs> but it's <laughs> but you know. But I do I do believe that you know it's a kind of if you build it they will come. Yeah. You know where as more and more sites become available throughout the UK of what I call the new generation of modular homes, people will see that it's really good quality housing that looks beautiful. We, you know, we, we pay attention not just to the house itself, but, you know, how it blends with the local vernacular. So we put the bricks on and put the roof on on site to give that different, you know, that, that curb appeal. And we're also very sensitive about green space, um, neck biodiversity gain on site. The site in Bristol, which I'm very pleased to say we've just won a design award for, yeah. um, you know, has um, a community orchard, it has a cycleway through it, it has a, um, a, a scientific, uh, an area of special scientific interest on it, and we're really trying to create green spaces, places and spaces that people can enjoy. So, you know, I think if you do things in the right way, you can, can be. you can you can create spaces that people aspire to live in. And the, the myth, you know, that's my mission in life, the <laughs> myth of, of, of modular will dissolve and people will aspire to live in a modular home rather than a traditionally built home. That's that's my my objective, my aim. Good. 
of a positive conclusion, which I like. That's good. Brilliant. All right. Um, last but not least, we'll hear from Patrick Melia, Melia, who I'll remind you is the chief executive of Sunderland City Council has been, and has been heavily involved in various regeneration um, housing-led schemes. Over to you, Patrick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Can I just add a little bit extra to that of answer? Course you can. Um, if, you, if you're buying a car and you go online, you spec the car to how you want yep. it. To, so it comes out of the factory to your specification, which will be, you, you will be able to do that with houses in the future. You will be able to spec it online and the house will come different. So your walls internally will be in a different place to your neighbour's so walls internally. So products. you can make unique products. Yep. And okay. I think that's part of the innovation as you go forward. Um, if I can, I'll just say a little bit about Sunland, what we are as a city, and then I'll talk around what that means for us in terms of housing, and very much picking up a lot of what Rosie said, our housing journey and where we're going as a city is very much aligned. Um, I like to talk about Sunland being a city of innovation and a city of ambition, uh, and that's deep in our DNA. So forgive me, but if I go back to 600 AD, and Benedict Biscop mm -hmm. came to, to Sunland as it was then, um, wanted to create a monastery, but not just any old monastery. He wanted the best in the world. So he went and got the best stone masons. He wanted the best choir. So he went to Rome to get the best choir masters. He wanted to put glass into the monastery. We didn't just do glass, we did stained glass windows, the first in the world. And that innovation, that ambition, goes through our, our DNA as a city. So when you talk about Joseph Swan and the light bulb, Joseph Swan was born in very much the same place as that monastery was first built. Um, you think about shipbuilding, we were the largest shipbuilding town in the world at one point, and we drove loads of innovation in shipbuilding and design and using iron and steel for shipbuilding. And we did the same in coal mining. And today, we do it in factories building cars. We built the first um, battery plant in Europe those batteries from that plant go into a Nissan Leafs, which is the largest selling EV vehicle, electric vehicle in the world. And it's that innovation and that DNA that we want to take in the house building and creating a new ecosystem around house building going forward. And we think we're well placed to do that as a city. We've got some great plans as a city at the moment in terms of moving forward. Um, we've got a, an exciting regeneration site called Riverside Sunland. So and you visited, yep. um, that's around creating a million square feet of office space and a thousand new homes, creating four new com communities that will revitalise our city centre, change what future high streets look like and create something very different in terms of how we live in the future. Our million square feet of office space, um, great partnership with Legal in general in bringing that forward for three new buildings. Um, First building's up, we start to occupy it next month, so really exciting times in our city. The next two buildings, uh, enabling works are happening. So the business district's happening, it's moving. What we now need to move into is creating the homes for people occupying those buildings to live in. The hoardings go up next month for the first 132 homes of those thousand new homes. They will be built using modern methods of construction. What we're heading to as a city is in 2023, what we're calling the Future Living Expo. So when we look to uh, what our colleagues do in Northern Europe and in Finland, they have housing fairs, housing markets, where they showcase innovation in housing. We will do that in the UK, in Sunderland, in 2023. It's a three-year programme. We've been very much exploring advanced manufacturing and modern methods of construction in this last year. <coughs> the next year of the programme, we're looking at sustainability and the green agenda, because that's going to be really important in terms of how we live in the future. And the third aspect of it is all around smart living and smart homes and what does a house of the future really do for us and how do we bring that to life? So exciting, how do you actually make that happen? I think you make that happen through ambition and vision and that's really important. But what's been key to us as well is actually a strong planning framework. So we've gone through our local plan, it's in place, we have a core strategy that supports what we need to do in that process, yes, we have developed really great relationships with the traditional house builders. They are off building 7,000 new homes over this next eight to 10 years in the city. There's no barriers to that. We are supporting that and enabling that. But as Rosie said, we need to change 
houses of the future. We need to change the way we work. And we see Riverside Sunderland as being a real national exemplar in terms of how we do that. So that's why we want a really good relationship um, with the Secretary of State, with Chris and his team in terms of that delivery. We are leveraging private sector funding, but actually the levelling up funds are going to be really important for us as well in terms of moving forward because of part of that housing ecosystem we're trying to create in Sunderland. Yes, we want to build modern methods of construction. Therefore, actually, we want a manufacturing plant. We want to learn from those manufacturers that we have in the city in the automotive uh, sector and take that into house building of the future. And we think we're well placed in terms of having the skills and a great workforce that will build modern methods of construction in our city, not just for our city, but for the region and beyond. But very much, and I think a theme that we've heard today is around skills. And a part of our funding bid into, uh, in the levelling up fund is around creating a new, what we're calling a housing innovation uh, construction skills academy, HICSA. Really important, the skills of the future so that as we build new housing, not just how do we build them, how do we construct them on site, but how do we also then maintain them in the future as well is going to be really important. But as part of that new academy, we're also looking to retrofit and what are the skills that we need to put in place to retrofit existing properties as well, and we see that as really important. So we're really trying to create that ecology um, of being able to have land, have a planning framework that allows modern methods of construction, have the ability to build off-site, and then support through a whole skills agenda. But zero carbon is really important as well. So part of that thousand new homes and that new business district we're building, we've um, been successful in some funding from government, around three million pounds to really explore net zero, net carbon. So how do we generate energy on site? We sit on mines, we sit on a river, we sit next to the coast, many different opportunities to create energy, but also around battery storage. And we have expertise in the city around batteries and battery storage and how you repurpose batteries. Um, also about management of electricity and energy on site is going to be really important and how you manage that. So it's about creating that ecosystem so that not only do we build in, in sustainable methods, we actually live sustainably going forward. And building on some of the things Rosie said, I'll, I'll try not to duplicate, but one of the key things we need to do, and I think Chris and I touched on it yesterday in a different session, was actually people living in these properties will need to be educated when to open the window, when to shut the door, when to allow ventilation to actually get the benefits from these modern new homes, and that's going to be really important to us as well. And then the, the last thing for me is that whole smart agenda. It's really important. We talk a lot about gigabit connectivity, putting fibre in the ground. We are doing that as a city. Um, we won five million from the Building Back Better Fund to put 5G Wi-Fi connectivity into our new Riverside Sunderland site. So those homes will have the best and latest technology in terms of connectivity. Well, that, that will actually allow them to be smart homes. It'll actually allow us to do things differently. So what we're building is homes for the future. And as part of the 1,000 new homes, we, um, there was uh, Reba and BRE ran a, a competition on behalf of government in terms of the Homes 2030 design competition. Some of those homes uh, will be built in Sunderland as part of the Riverside Sunderland project. So we're really showcasing innovation, ambition, and not just um, what a house looks like, but actually how you live in that house, how you work with your communities, how you work with people, and how you live in that communities, uh, and really exciting time. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good. Just a quick, um, quick, quick offshoot from something the minister said, um, which I'm going to ask the minister about shortly. Um, you talked about um, how Thanks planning for the pre-warning <laughs> <laughs> talked about planning being needing to be reformed. Um, just before I get to you, I'll quickly skirt to you. What, what would you think? So you're you're a city, so you're well placed to have this kind of overview, strategic overview of what needs to happen in terms of improvement and regeneration for your city. What would, if you could decide today, how, what, what, what about the current planning system would change to make your life easier, to make it easier to deliver the kind of um, ambitions and aspirations you talked about? Or do you think the planning system it's is okay as it is? Or, or I don't think you're ever going to make everyone happy with the no. planning system, no matter how you design it. Yeah. Um, I think the important thing for me is the planning system should allow quality products 
Um, how we make it easier for people to build is important, yeah. so how we re reduce the barriers. Um, but I think one of the key things is around how people get engaged in the planning system is a real difficulty. Yeah. So I think, I know one, I've been in two different authorities and produced local plans. Yeah. Thousands of people get involved in the development of the local plan. Mm. You get thousands of responses mm. to the development of the local plan and the core strategy. What you don't get then is subsequently when the planning application comes in to put some houses on a site, yeah, you get very little involvement. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think that's something that we really need to look forward to. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. And um, as I pre-warned you, Minister, <laughs> about um, planning, um, planning constantly comes up as a kind of obstacle or issue in terms of delivery of housing and of quality. I mean, are, are there any kind of headline revisions or reforms, I know the planning bill is working its way through um, Parliament, that you would like to see or are about to be revealed that would, um, would give meat to the bones of how planning is going to be reformed? Well, let me give you a, a, a couple of examples. And I've okay. spoken already about the need to speed up the system yep. and make plans um, much more uh, agile and current. And about half the local plans in the country that local authorities have are out of date. There are some authorities yeah. that don't have plans, or at least plans which have been uh, changed in the last 30 years or so, believe it or not. So we need to get local plans in place because that protects the land supply and it protects the local community from speculative development, from uh, applicants who want to build where the local authority would prefer them not to, but because they haven't got an up-to-date plan in place, mm. it's more difficult for them to defend against um, appeals to the planning inspectorate yep. if um, the appellant feels that they want to get their application put through. So having local plans in place is really important to protect land supply and also to speed up the planning process. I'd mention one other thing. Um, you, you will know that in our consultation on our white paper on reform, we proposed reforming Section 106 and yeah. SILS, the two mechanisms by which affordable homes and local infrastructure are provided, replacing Section 106 particularly with a single infrastructure levy. The point being that Section 106, a bit like the planning system itself, is very opaque, yep. it can be very slow, and it means that infrastructure to support new building comes along either very late in the day or comes along in a way that wasn't wanted or anticipated by yeah. the community at the outset because of claims that um, you know uh, viability has changed. So we want infrastructure to be put in early so that local communities get the bang for the buck that they expect if development is going to take place near to them. And the infrastructure levy, which is designed to provide clarity about how um, uh, affordable homes infrastructure needs to be provided, the cost of it, so developers know what they've got to spend, and therefore the uh, local authority has the ability to commission those uh, infrastructure developments earlier in the development process. I think that will really change the way right. in which local authorities are able to get what they want uh, and that communities feel comfortable that when development occurs close to them or on them, then the infrastructure to support that development will be there. Okay. All right, excellent. Um, I'd like to thank all the panellists for their contribution. Um, we'll just have a, I've probably let, let time overrun, but um, just before I open, um, open to the floor, which I will do shortly, um, I just want to have one really, I'll ask one really quick question to all the panellists. If you keep the answer really quick, then we'll open to the floor. Um, in, my, in light of, of what you said, um, your presentation, just, what from, just from all of you, what do you think is the biggest challenge, just one biggest single challenge to delivering this ambition we all want of more homes and better quality homes? Just really quick answer before I open the floor. Start with um, well, I you, think Liz. I stick with the skills issue. It's okay. a challenge that we need to get uh, more high-skilled workers into the sector. Okay, all right. Um, Minister, what would you think? The planning system needs to be reformed and we need to embrace modern methods of construction. Right. What would, you, yeah. what would you say? I'll bin, build on that and say it needs to be more predictable from a technical requirements perspective. The you know, planning system. The planning system. It's often very much dependent on a local officer and their yeah. interpretation of the rules. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think in terms of MMC, the big thing for me is scale. Okay. Scale will bring viability. Yeah. And actually bring this to life. Yeah. 
Okay. And if you can get that skill, then that will drive the, the skills agenda as well. As well. Okay, brilliant. All right. I think we can summarise that as skills and planning. So at least we've um, identified the enemies. So <laughs> we've just got to try and overcome them now. The so critical thing. Exactly. Nice and easy, obviously. Right. Enough talking from me. I'm going to pass um, over uh, lots of questions, which is good. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start at the front and work my way backwards. Um, uh, over here first, trap in the blue tie, please. And then um, after, after you... Um, the, the shirt over here. We'll try and come to. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely shirt. <laughs> I'm also wearing a shirt, but it's not as good as that. One, so. um, Alex Morton from the Centre for Policy Studies. Okay, um, I want to make a pitch, though, for a policy exchange idea and report. Uh, okay. And I hope Ike will keep the good work up on the um, street votes, okay. uh, which is something where you would allow areas to choose to. Uh, upgrade to terraced housing, you could do that through MMC. Yep. Um, I think it's, it's a great policy that's come out of policy exchange, so I'm going to hawk a, 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 a fellow think tanker's ideas and uh, put the minister under pressure to say what a great idea it is, and hopefully we're <laughs> in the planning bill. Thank you. Oh, it's good to have you. That's very good. Hi there, I'm Bruce Buckland. I'm an architect and SME developer. Um, in terms of the planning system and its sort of reform and specifically its digitization, the planning system is a very analog process at the moment involving lots of written documents and, and drawings in very sort of analog forms of PDFs. Uh, so I suppose a question to the minister, what is the government doing in its reforms to fully and meaningfully digitize the planning system in regards to things like BIM um, and the use of intelligent information rather than more analog processes. Okay. I right, um, just have one more question from here and then um, we'll work our way back, but if we just have questions in twos and then the panel can deal with it. So over to you, Jim. Thank you, Ike, and thank you, panel. Um, Gordon Adams, Battersea Power Station. Uh, quite controversially, I actually don't have a problem with the current planning system. I just think there's, I just think there's too much in it. Planning used to be about land use and appearance, whereas mission creep scope has blown out for you know well-intentioned reasons um uh but planning uh, you know being used to be the solution has become the problem and L lewisham um council's uh, a local plan i think is about 400 pages long uh and i heard of a condition on a planning permission that said um uh, you know the development must demonstrate how uh, it will advance the uh, welsh language so uh not land use nor appearance and not helping to build the homes that, that we need if, that, if that's the priority and i thought the nppf was brilliant at reducing over a thousand pages down to 52 uh the world hasn't ended it still works well can the minister what does the minister think about um an equivalent reduction in scope um of policies at a local level um to to focus on the priority of you know land use and appearance okay so digitization of the planning system and um what we've just heard oh it's for me yes right. i think so sorry <laughs> uh, well alex first of all uh, pitched um policy exchanges street votes idea I think there's lots to commend it, and I'm very happy to look at the proposition for this reason, that we need to find means by which we incentivise local communities to think that development close to them is actually quite a good thing. And that's one of the reasons why we are looking at revising um, Section 106 and SILs into an infrastructure levy so that uh, infrastructure that's required when new properties are built is provided earlier. That's an incentive if you get the GP surgery built early or the school built alongside the development or the, the roundabout or the playgrounds built rapidly. That's an incentive to saying, yes, we want development close to us. We also need to make sure that communities have a much more say and control over the design of properties in their vicinity. So the local vernacular and aesthetic can be um, included in local planning considerations. And that's why we're requiring uh, each local authority to have an office for place, uh, an officer for place, uh, that can help local authorities design local design codes. So yes, we're looking for incentives to ensure that people find development to be good rather than bad, as I think has become increasingly the case uh, over the last 30 years or so. Bruce uh, talked about digitalisation and what we're going to do to ensure that we, um, both in terms of the front end and the back end, make the system uh, smarter. I use as an example, I think, in the talk I gave yesterday, one of the biggest 
um, reasons, I am told, that individual uh, local planning applications are rejected uh, because most applications, of course, are applications for a well, they're, they're applications for an extension mm. or what have you, you know, very small applications. But the reason why the, so many of them get rejected is because <coughs> Compass Point North is often missed out from the application. If you digitize the system uh, so that Compass Point North will always be on the digital application, you at a stroke remove one of the reasons why there's delay and obfuscation in the process. So we want to make the system much more map-based, much more navigable, much more, if you will, three-dimensional, so everybody can see what is proposed for their uh, local community. And local planners, because you remove so much bump, and I think this goes to some extent to answer Gordon's question as well, we remove so much bump from the system that local planners can think strategically about the design of their communities and engage with their communities on that design rather than deal with the tactical day-to-day -day considerations of dormer window uh, applications. Not to say that dormer window applications are not important. <laughs> they are, but we need to think strategically, not tactically. And to your point, Gordon, yeah, we've got to make sure that we don't create another leviathan of words uh, which just get in the way of sensible decisions being made. So one of the, the, the crucial points I made to officials when we began this process was I want clarity of rules, I want simplicity of rules, so that there's far less opportunity for all sorts of clever people to argue the toss about them, and they be, they be outcomes focused rather than process driven. And I hope if we achieve that, we will also play a small part in speeding up our planning system. Okay, all right. More questions. Um, uh, top of the glasses in the blue seat, we'll start, and then um, over here with the uh, um, dark suit lanyard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, both glasses. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay, the, the chap you're next. Uh, yeah, you, you, so, sorry. <laughs> it's going to be a Hi there. Um, I'm uh, Owen Pugh from the Woodland Trust. Um, I just want to say, I appreciate anything that accelerates the Welsh language myself personally, but obviously I appreciate planning isn't the way to do it. Um, I should just say, um, I'm very lucky personally that I now live in a new build NHBC uh, quality house um, in uh, Rutland. Um, but the problem that I, I want to talk about is is uh, dem dem the example of a bigger problem. Um, so the development where I live, um, they've uh, put uh, th part of the planning application had tree-lined streets, and that's obviously a key part of the new planning uh, bill uh, and, and one that's very welcome. Uh, the problem is is that uh, when the developer has passed it on to the management company, they haven't put in any, any consideration of watering those trees, so they've never been watered, so half of them have died. Um, and well, there goes the whole tree-lined streets idea. So the problem is, is that, so what I'd like to ask is that when the government does put in tree-lined streets as part of the planning bill, and very welcome uh, measure it is, um, will there be some sort of compulsion for developers to have arrangements with the management companies who take on the land before the council does, to water the trees so we actually enjoy the tree line streets for more than just two years before the trees die. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you. Sorry, I'm going to shift. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Very brief, please. Any, any, any other questions? Quite single line, if, if possible. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Roger Smith, I, I'm also a planner. Actually, just on that point about landscaping, there should, be a, there should have been a standard condition requiring them to maintain it probably for five years. Uh, before it was adopted, so perhaps, perhaps that was forgotten. Uh, m my question is really aimed at, uh, at Rosie uh, and, and AMC. Um, in terms of the volume builders who are perhaps dipping their toe into MMC at the moment, but they're not really embracing it on any scale, wh why is that? Okay, all right. To the well, just to the uh, point you made about your, um, I'm sure, very lovely uh, home in Rutland. Um, it is, as you will appreciate, a, the responsibility of the local authority when it develops its conditions to make clear that those uh, conditions uh, should be enforced. So I trust that Rutland is, is doing that. But I will go away and have a talk to the officials just to see if there's something that we can do, not necessarily specifically about watering of trees, but just making sure that um, uh, conditions uh, are properly enforced and met. We do want in the uh, reforms that we're engendering, by the way, to, to beef up enforcement powers across the piece. Uh, so perhaps that is one. 
I'll let Rosie deal with the ONC <laughs> question. I, I think just in general, you know, doing what we're doing in MMC um, is not for the faint-hearted. You know, it takes quite a significant investment to do it at the scale that we have the ambition to do. Um, and it's not untypical that any major change, you know, takes new entrants to sort of disrupt a market and then, you know, the market kind of follows. So I think we're starting to see some of the big house builders, if you like, do little bits of MMC, you know, bring that into the way in which they're building traditionally. And I, and I actually think that's a good thing. You know, they, they, not everyone has to build their houses in a factory. Um, but, but you know, I think it, it takes often takes externals to come in and, and change an industry. And I think that's what... You know, we're trying to do plus a num you know there's a number of other um, major investments gone into MMC uh, we work quite closely in collaboration with a number of other major MMC companies and you know we're all trying to change the market in a slightly different way okay thank you um, two questions down here you can go first and then um, hi um, I'm Nathaniel from inside housing magazine um, minister I just wanted to ask um, uh, a question about um, a remark you made earlier during your opening um, remarks. You you said um, that you're keen to reinvigorate the right to buy, which has clearly been a, a sort of key lever that the government has used to um, promote and boost home ownership in over the last um, decade or so. Um, if I'm right, I think I'm right in saying that would be a re reinvigoration or even arguably a re re reinvigoration. Um, what sort of measures are you thinking about? How would you propose to reinvigorate the right to buy it again? Well, as you probably know, we have um, run some pilots on right to buy uh, to uh, ensure that the very important opportunity that people have to buy their home, the home that they live in, the home that they possibly improved, maybe extended, um, should be given to them. I think we can do a number of things. I think we can look when we run uh, future pilots at um, backfilling any dropouts in the total number of um, opportunities to right to buy that are in that particular scheme. So you maximise the opportunity for right to buy. We can also look at the advice that we give uh, to local authorities about how they communicate the rights and indeed housing associations, the rights uh, that uh, residents have and the opportunities that should be afforded to them um, so that they can make crucial decisions about uh, choosing to pursue the opportunity to, to rights to buy. So there are a number of things that we can do, and those are the sorts of things I'm considering. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Minister uh, David Blackman, uh, uh, freelance writer on sort of housing and planning. Um, you mentioned the infrastructure levy. That was a very key aspect of the of the of the of the, of the planning white paper last year. You mentioned digitisation. Um, I just w I know that the 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 the, the, the planning reform the, the, the pause has, has recently been sort of signalled. But can you give any clarity today on the future of the proposal surrounding zoning, particularly the proposal that um, that uh, an allocation of forward plan should bring with it a form of consent? Thank you. Well, I think. Zoning is a misnomer because people infer, quite understandably from zoning, huge swathes of land might fall within a particular area. What we're really talking about here are sites. Sites can be big, sites can be small, but they're definable sites that local authorities choose to pick as the places that they want to see development take place. And we want to have more predictability in the system, as you know, so that when developers, big or small, particularly small, uh, know what the rules are up front about the uh, density, the design, the split between commercial and residential, when those sorts of considerations are clearly set out up front in the local plan, then developers should be able to get on and uh, start the process of developing. That will enable uh, certainty in the development community, which, as I say, will help SMEs. It will also give greater certainty to local communities about what is going to happen in their vicinity because it will be in their plan. Uh, we're keen to pursue those sorts of uh, clear policy considerations, and you'll be hearing more about them soon. Thank you. Right. Um, I'd like to 
Sorry for no questions. Um, time, time, time is against us, I apologise. But I'd like to close the session by um, offering my warmest thanks to the panel for some really interesting, erudite, succinct answers, um, grappling with difficult subjects, obviously not able to solve them in an hour, but I think they really <laughs> shed some good lights on, um, on the issues. And thank you for, the, um, for you for listening as well, for the great questions too. Um, the um, video, I believe, will be available on um, various online means, um, <laughs> YouTube, um, Instagram, and, um, but anyway, you'll be, able, you'll be able to find it um, online if you want to um, hear, hear more of it. So thank you very much all for attending and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks.